Hey everyone, um, welcome to this afternoon or tonight, this evening, depending on where you're joining from. Um, welcome to tonight's panel where we'll be discussing the importance of protecting country in the era of anthropogenic climate change and the Greens' commitment to such action. Now, um, wherever we're watching from tonight, we're on the unceded lands of Australia's First Peoples. I'm joining tonight's panel from Wurundjeri country and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded on this continent and that the fight for climate justice necessarily entails First Nations justice. Tonight we'll be hearing from three passionate speakers who are super committed to fighting for climate action and bouncing off the reminder that COP26 has given us of the urgency of climate justice. So first up, we've got Steph Hodgins-May, who is our Greens candidate for McNamara. Um, and Steph is a local mum trained in environmental law who lives with her partner, Oggy, and son Otis in Elwood. Steph has lived in the electorate since she was a young adult, um, moving here from the farm to work and study. She fell in love with the area and has been here ever since. Um, passionate about climate action and our natural environment, Steph has worked as an environmental lawyer and also as an advisor for the Australian government at the UN to protect our climate, forests and oceans. Steph loves to volunteer locally to protect our nature and care for community. This includes at her local playgroup, the Elwood Toy Library and Sacred Heart Mission, um, who provide meals and housing for the most in need. We'll also be hearing from Larissa Waters, who is the first Australian's Greens Senator for Queensland, my home state and is the co-deputy leader of the Australian Greens and the Greens leader of the Senate. She took office in July of 2011 and is the national spokesperson on women's issues, democracy and the public sector. Um, Senator Waters is an environmental lawyer as well, who worked in the community sector for nine years, advising people how to use the law to protect the environment, as she should. She was named Australian Young Environmental Lawyer of the Year in 2010 by the Law Council of Australia. She's passionate about representative democracy and public participation, accountability in government, equality for women, and protecting our environment. As leader of the Greens in the Senate, she's working to improve federal laws to put an end to domestic violence, transition to renewable energy resources, and clean up politics by entering corporate, ending corporate donations to political parties that buy favours for the big end of town and not real people. Um, she lives in Brisbane at the moment with her two young daughters, um, the younger of whom caused a bit of a stir when she became the first baby to ever be breastfed in federal parliament. And our third and final guest will also um, will be Bob Brown, who was born and educated in rural New South Wales and worked as a doctor be before becoming the face of the campaign to save the Franklin River back all the way in 1982. Um, he was elected to Tassie State Parliament in 1983 and over the course of his 10 year tenure, most notably advocated for um, gun law reform, queer law reform and achieved the expansion of the Tassie Wilderness World Heritage Area. Um, in 1996, Bob was elected to the Senate, where he led the national debate for 16 years on issues including climate change, democracy, preventative health care, conservation and human rights. Um, Bob resigned from the Senate in uh, June 2012 to establish the Bob Brown Foundation, which is a not-for-profit dedicated to supporting action campaigns for the environment in Australia and the surrounding regions. He's a published author and acclaimed photographer, and Bob currently lives near Signet in Tasmania with his partner, Paul Thomas, and when he gets the chance, enjoys photography, bushwalking, poetry, and philosophy. So um, without further ado, I shall now pass on to Bob, who's going to start us off, I believe. Supporting first of all, up. Steph, uh, in her bid to become the next member and a Greens member for McNamara, she would be a phenomenal addition to the Greens team in the federal parliament. And uh, very vitally, because I've got no doubt that Adam Bant will be re-elected next door in Melbourne, uh, that vital second vote, and I'm not uh, limiting our potential to two votes in the lower house. And it is a very, a very important second vote to have. It means that you can 
call for divisions and this. You can do a whole range of things that as an individual by themselves can't do unless they can arrange somebody to support them. Steph will be a great candidate. Uh, known you for a long time, Steph, and uh, I know that you would be a remarkably good addition to the Australian Parliament, both for McNamara, also for Victoria, and not least for the whole country and beyond that for the planet. And talking of that, uh, here we are looking at where the Greens are going to uh, figure or how we've figured in the world of environmentalism over the, over the years to come. Now, do you want me to talk about that now? You would? Okay. I've just been into Hobart where the Greens are having the 21st anniversary of entering the Hobart City Council. Deputy Mayor Helen Burnett was the host there. Just over the way at the Hobart Town Hall on the 23rd of March 1972, 50 years ago, in four or five months' time, uh, Dick Jones, who was then a professor of environment at the University of Tasmania, called together a meeting to establish a new political party because Lake Pedder was being flooded. And uh, it was one of the most gently beautiful places on the planet. You can read about it. Most of you will know about it. And there's a big campaign to have it restored now 50 years down the line. It's flooded for a hydroelectric scheme by the bullies in government uh, and in the Hydroelectric Commission back in those days. It became the first big national environmental campaign in Australia. Uh, the lake was lost that year and the Greens set up as called the United Tasmania Group back there, the name Greens was a decade away, uh, just filed by 100 votes to win their first seat under a huge hail of condemnation from big business, those corporations that we were just hearing about. Uh, and that led to the formation of the Wilderness Society in Tasmania, the fight for the Franklin, and then out of the fight of the Franklin after 17 days in jail, uh, along with lots of colleagues for bulldozers, I got into the Tasmanian Parliament in 1983 and was there for 10 years. And in those 10 years, our numbers grew to two in 1986 and then to five in 1989. But that was a crucial origin, if you like, for us at a Tasmanian level. This fight for the wilderness, for the for Lake Petter, which we lost, but then for the Franklin, which we won. And it went on to be uh, become the centre of the World Heritage Area. And it's now one of the 10 great white water rafting adventures on the planet. And the people who listed that gave it number one because it's not the biggest, but it's the wildest uh, experience that you can have of those 10 rivers anywhere around the world, which says something about how rapidly wilderness is disappearing. What's wilderness? Well, wilderness is an area that's remote, that's pristine, that's largely devoid of the impact of modern technology. And of course, wilderness everywhere except Antarctica has had people living in it for thousands of years. It's, um, it's a, a compliment to uh, know that wilderness formed us. It made us who we are. It, uh, we human beings in spirit, soul, in our physical attributes were made for wilderness and from wilderness. That's why we give each other a bunch of real flowers to say I love you, not a bunch of plastic flowers. They simply will not do. It's because we come out of this wild and natural planet and we allow it to be destroyed at our peril. And the Greens have, uh, coming from that origin, have at the forefront the campaigning for the environment. It's gone on to Daintree, the Daintree in Queensland, the world's, uh, the Australia's largest tropical rainforest, for Kakadu, uh, for the great coastal areas of Western Australia, for the forests, uh, right down the line, for the wildlife in Australia against whaling, 
off Antarctica. We took a primary role in that. And the numbers have grown because the urgency has got worse and we're left with the choice, voters are left with the choice of voting for protectors of the natural environment upon which we totally depend, we human beings in this global biosphere, or voting for Labor and Liberal who are destroying it. And one of the big surprises, when uh, the Franklin campaign came out the right way, I was asked what the future was. And I said, we're in a new age of environmentalism here. How wrong I was. The, corp the corporations have got together to continue to burn, mine and drill. I'm quoting here from Mr. Guterres of the United Nations speaking at COP26 just a couple of days ago, to burn, mine and drill in forests, for example, and it's got to stop. We're losing the planet too fast. And it's the Greens who put the hand up and do the stopping. And who are the voice for environmentalists in the state and national parliaments, in local government and at global level? And, uh, you know, it's very, very... People say to me, Bob, why weren't you Prime Minister? <laughs> and I say, because 90% of people didn't vote Green. And it's not until people do vote green and add to that great compliment of people like Larissa and her colleagues in Parliament by putting in Stephanie. And what a great addition again she will be advocating for the environment in this age of climate emergency and extinction crisis that will get things right. We see the Greens growing in Germany where they're negotiating balance of power or part of government actually, much more than balance of power at the moment. Our Greens colleagues have, for example, uh, the Minister for the Environment in New Zealand. The Greens are in more than 80 nations around the world. In fact, we had the first global Greens conference in Canberra in 2001. And here we are on the threshold of another election, which feels to me like 2010, when the Greens suddenly went from four to 10 people in Parliament. We're so badly needed. In a, after the COP26, which is on its road to failure, and governments, not least our own, deplorably doing what the mega rich exploiters want to do rather than what's in the interests of humanity and our fellow species. So I'm very, very lucky to have seen the changes that have come down the line, to see the evolution of the Greens and tonight to be part of this panel talking about the prospect of this sterling individual, Steph, becoming part of a team to transform the way Australia has behaved, in particular in this last five years, so that we go from the back of the class in protecting the planet to the front of the class where we used to be once more. So everybody, I'm here, as I'm sure you are, for Steph and this campaign for McNamara. I feel very excited about it. There's something in the air. Uh, well, the words of the Prime Minister are helping, no doubt. There's something in the air uh, that is turning people to think we've got to vote differently at this next election. So it's only a few months away. It's very exciting. We're going to roll our sleeves up, open our wallets up, and where we see value, and that's there. Get behind her, because it's those few votes that count as Greens take new seats. And I think we're going to do it in this next election. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bob. Um, I think what you said was 
um, really inspiring. And I think just like so many more people need to be voting Greens, as we all know, like everyone here watching this afternoon tonight, like knows that like, people need to be voting Greens. And as Bob said, you know, we went from four people in Parliament to 10 in 2010. So why not make that like 22 people in 22? Why, yes. why not even more? Yes. Exactly, yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Let's grow the greens. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, now I'm going to pass on to Larissa, um, who's going to talk sort of about the situation that's going on in Parliament and especially with, you know, Labour and um, LNP and what the sort of like vandalism they've been up to and what's stopping no. climate action and the greens from actually progressing. Um, but before I pass on to Larissa, um, we'd just uh, love to let everyone know that if you've got any questions, feel free to pop them in the comments section and we'll try to get back to them. Um, yeah, over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Ash. Hi, everybody. Hi, Bob. Hi, Steph. It's really wonderful Hi. to be joining you tonight. Um, I'm calling in from Mianjin, uh, which is the land of the Turrbal and Yagara people, and sovereignty was never ceded in this ancient land of ours. So wherever you're watching from, it is and was and will always be Aboriginal land. And we have a long way to go in this country to have genuine reconciliation. And that starts with treaties, which we are slowly working for. Uh, but it's just glorious to be here tonight with a bunch of nature lovers and all of you watching who hopefully feel the same. And it's a bit of a parallel universe, really, because we've just seen our Prime Minister on the world stage at the 26th Conference of the Parties at the Climate Convention just make a real sausage of himself. He uh, certainly hasn't made many friends and he's just a walking disaster zone. And I, you know, I normally don't like to stoop to insults, but I'm afraid that you couldn't find a man more deserving of them. So we've just had the COP26 where Australia used the opportunity to spruik more fossil fuels um, and to spruik this mythical uh, fantasy of carbon capture and storage and even went so far as to have a podium at our pavilion sponsored by Santos, one of the biggest polluters that we've got um, in this nation who are wanting to frack First Nations land and release more methane and pocket more private dollars while they cook the planet. So you just couldn't make this stuff up. We're, Australia didn't sign on to the methane reduction pledge. Um, we didn't sign on to the pledge to say that we would phase out um, coal-fired power. We, of course, won't stop subsidising fossil fuels with public dollars. And you just scratch your head and think, why is our government so deaf to the science? And I've got the democracy portfolio for the Greens and I take a bit of a look at the money that flows into the re-election coffers of Labor and Liberal. And an awful lot of it comes from big corporations and an awful lot of it comes from big coal, oil and gas corporations. And I think that's why we have such terrible climate policies. Those big polluters are paying to get the policy outcomes that suit their corporate profits. And they don't seem to give a damn about the planet or, you know, what's going to be left for all of the other species that we share this world with, let alone our own future generations. So it's all down to the almighty dollar. And um, sadly, we see both uh, the Liberal and the Labor parties in cahoots when it comes to shitty climate policy, pardon my language. Um, we've just had a, a sitting in Parliament a couple of weeks ago um, and Every time we move an amendment to say phase out fossil fuels or stop giving more taxpayer subsidies to fossil fuels, and we try to do that to every possible bill we can, every time you see Labor and Liberal vote together to oppose that amendment and to support giving more taxpayer dollars to, to polluters. It, it just makes absolutely no sense and it breaks our heart every single time. Um, because I think that Australians want funding for renewable energy, they want funding for everyone to have a home, um, they want funding for our schools and our hospitals. They don't want funding to go to the likes of Origin and Santos and, and the big coal companies. Um, it's Labor and Liberal that are totally out of step with our community in that regard, not to mention out of step with the climate science. So 
that's just a bit of a brief overview of the predicament that we're in and it's of course why we need more greens in parliament it's why we need more women in parliament and in my humble opinion as an environmental lawyer it's why we need more environmental lawyers in parliament um, and stuff is all of those things and I, the, the hope for me comes from the fact that we are so close to changing this hideous, morally bankrupt government. And if all the polls are even close to true, which is a big ask, but it's looking like we're headed, headed for a hung parliament. Now, the last time we had a hung parliament, we had the Greens in balance of power in the lower house and in the Senate, and we got world leading climate laws. And not to mention that, we also got a down payment on putting dental care into Medicare um, so that kids and folk on um, social support payments could actually afford to go to the dentist. We've got a few other things as well, but it's an indication of what we can achieve when we have that influential role. And with people like Steph winning McNamara um, and with our fabulous Queensland candidates hopefully winning the seats of um, Griffith and Brisbane and Ryan and the Senate to kick out Pauline Hanson, we stand to be in the balance of power again in both houses. And that's when you will see us be able to push the new government to go further and faster on climate action, on biodiversity protection, on social justice, on First Nations justice, on all of the things that I think mainstream Australia really wants some action on. So it's an exciting opportunity for us. We've never been more needed because we are in a climate crisis. We've lost 50% of the coral cover in the Great Barrier Reef in my beautiful home state of Queensland. We're in a biodiversity crisis that doesn't get a lot of mention um, from the big political parties. We are really, it's the 11th hour for the planet and that we're even still having a debate about whether to subsidise fossil fuels or whether to um, continue to clear forests like there's no tomorrow is just, I'm incredulous at that. And we definitely need politicians, Greens, who aren't for sale to the highest bidder, who won't do the bidding of the big corporations and the big polluters and who will genuinely act in the public interest and put the interests of the community and the planet first. So this is a, a great chance um, for us to fix the future, if we do so humbly uh, suggest. And I just think Steph would be marvellous in Parliament and I can't wait to have her in the party room contributing to our decision-making process and just helping to, you know, kick the butts of all of those other bastards that have sold out. So <laughs> sorry, Bob, I'm terrible potty mouth still. Um, but yeah, we've got a real chance here to fix our climate laws, to fix our environment laws, to deliver on finally gender equality, social equality, and so much more. So um, I might I might conclude my comments there, and I'm really looking forward to to any questions that people have. It's my pleasure to be supporting Steph. Thanks so much, Larissa. Look, I couldn't have put it any better than you. I think everything you had to say about like what's going on in parliament and you know, why they've put us in the mess we're in is so true and so well put and you know steph is the person we need to be getting into parliament like she cares about all the right issues she's got great experience and she knows what you know the community needs and yeah <laughs> Like, honestly, it's time that Australia steps up and actually votes green and, you know, gets real change happening that we should want, do want and you know, deserve as a country. But yeah, um, once again, everyone um, watching on Facebook, feel free to send in your questions. Um, but now I'm just going to pass back to Bob, um, who has another message for us. Well, that message is to have everybody support this campaign and the planet through electing Steph in any way they can. But of course, uh, there's a whole range in the campaign which people can engage in. But the biggest thing is to be able to fund that campaign so it can match the big spending big parties. Uh, that's a big job because as we know, they are highly funded by vested interests, like the miners, the loggers, 
uh, and and the people who just simply want to manipulate democracy to make more money out of it. Uh, that's where we come in. It's very, very important that uh, people consider donating to this campaign so that Steph is able to do the things that are required to match the spending power of the big parties. Uh, uh, that's it, it, we're at the moment getting ads from Clive Palmer on the front page of the Hobart Mercury every day. Uh, you can see uh, him slightly going up in the polls. He's buying his way to whatever aim it is he has. Uh, we need to be, the reality is we need to be able to match that. You cannot win a campaign with no funding. So, and it's uh, up to a certain limit, it's tax deductible. We'd like you to go well beyond that limit, but whatever it is, give what you can. Paul and I have already done and I'm very happily to Steph's campaign. But I'd like you to think about how much you can put towards investing in your future, for your children, and for this planet, through making this campaign work so that Steph actually gets into it. It does make a difference. And as Larissa was just pointing out, in 2010, we got the biggest uh, donation uh, from an individual uh, that the Greens have ever had then. It helped us to be able to run a bigger campaign and it helped us go from, uh, as we just heard from Ash again, uh, to double our, our complement in Parliament because we were able to get onto the, um, the line to be at bus stops, to have billboards, to have those things which make campaigns work please consider making the biggest donation you've ever made to politics. You've seen how the Prime Minister's going. See how hopeless that Labor are. They want to promote fossil fuels and destruction of forests, contributing to greenhouse gases in just about every, every single same way as the Liberals and National Party. We're in a planet in real strife. It's in our own hands. And if we put that into the hands of Steph and her colleagues, like Larissa and Adam Bant and team, we'll make, it will make a difference. We're in a democracy. Uh, the way to turn things around is to turn the government into one that's acting for the future. So please donate what you can. Get, get involved with this campaign. Not least of all, decide you are a green supporter and voter and you'll tell everybody that and tell everybody that they, it's no good complaining about this planet you have to act on it in fact action is much better than depression and action means getting behind steph in mcnamara so that when the numbers go up on election night she's there she's in the parliament she's with adam and larissa and team negotiating the terms, as Larissa's just been talking about, of a next period of government, which is going to be so much better than the diabolical fix we have at the moment. Thank you, Bob, once again. I think like all of us are definitely feeling um, a sense of, I guess, not hope in the current government that we have. And we can see that how like their performance sort of leaves Australia in a hopeless position. But Steph and the Greens are what are bringing hope back to the country because we know that we can turn things around and, you know, change Australia for the better. So without further ado, let's hear from our actual candidate, Steph. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, um, Larissa, Bob and Ash for joining us for this incredibly important conversation tonight. I'm calling in from unceded Boonarong land um, in so-called Elwood and want to begin by paying my respects to elders past and present and any First Nations people who are present or listening this evening. We recognise that sovereignty hasn't been ceded and um, despite 200 years of ongoing colonisation, First Nations, um, First Nations connect connections to country are still strong. We Greens will commit to working towards treaty and justice for all First Nations people because this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. 
Well, it's wonderful to be here tonight. While often volunteers are called NAMI, I like to think of us more as a forest. We're interconnected, we're sturdy and we're enduring. But like forests right across the world, we are in the fight of our lives. Like so many others working in the climate space, when the IPCC, Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released its part of its sixth report earlier this year, I was pretty flat. The conclusions were bleak. It was like reading a sort of avalanche of facts about increased natural disasters and bushfires that are etched into our memories. Greater loss of the Great Barrier Reef that uh, Larissa referred to and a pretty, pretty grim reading for anyone, um, I think especially a parent of a toddler um, that is, you know, coming into this world with so much unpredictability. But I think it's been my work in the lead up to COP26 going on in Glasgow now, the world's biggest climate conference, that has given me a bit of hope. I've been supporting Pacific Islanders living on the front lines of climate change to attend. I've listened to their stories of resilience and survival. And they reminded me that we need more than facts to win this election and to shift the, the narrative that we've got in this country to shift votes and to get the balance of power that we Greens so desperately need in order to really to safeguard our planet and our futures. We need stories and not just about what's at stake, which well, just not just stories about the stakes, which we know are high, but stories about the places we call home, stories about our own small corners of the planet as we know them and as we love them. My small corner of the earth was um, growing up a, in a, as a child in Jaja Wurrung country in the central highlands of Victoria, where the horizon is occasionally interrupted by the conical um, rises of distant volcanoes. My earliest was with my giant of a dad doing roadside tree plantings right across the district. He was an, a pioneer of organic farming and um, the director of Project Branch Out, which was the precursor to land care here in Victoria. Tree planting, soil health, the changing climate and local politics were very common conversations at our dinner table inside our little mud brick home powered by a humble, very unreliable off-grid system. Things have changed, thankfully. The farm was our sanctuary and the natural spring that ran through it was our, um, was our life source and Angel, our guardian. But we knew that what was happening beyond, uh, we knew what was happening beyond our tree covered oasis. We knew that no amount of roadside plantings could counter the huge swathes of land being cleared, the coal and gas being burned and the tight grip of the fossil fuel order on those who were elected to represent us. This grip is come, becoming tighter and more blatant and the old two, two old parties have been captured by millions of dollars in fossil fuel donations that they receive. As Larissa mentioned, you know, our government are representing us, us at COP in Glasgow and hosting Santos, one of the biggest fossil fuel, fossil fuel companies in this country. This is nothing new though. We know that those snake oil salesmen, often former MPs, are continuing to crawl the halls of parliament, spruiking their dirty and fraudulent technologies. And then there are the subsidies. Over the last year, between 2020 and 2021, a staggering $10 billion has been paid in subsidy, subsidies, and that's just under $20,000 a minute going towards coal, oil and gas companies. $20,000 a minute. Every day that the Labor and Liberal parties choose to listen to their lobbyists rather than the scientists who are saying 2050 is too late is a day that they're taking us towards willful climate collapse. But nonetheless, I have hope and, and we all should, we, we, we must. My hope's driven by the activists right across the world. It's driven by the people organising and protesting and mobilising in recognition that together we're, we're powerful. It's the Bobs and the Christines and the Larissas who have fought in our parliaments and now fighting on the front lines of some of the biggest environmental battles that we face. It's Ash, who is our MC tonight, who is taking on Australia's biggest polluter, AG, AGL. Thank you, Ash, for your work and advocacy. It's Anjali, Anjali Sharma, another young woman from here in Melbourne, who's taking on the Environment Minister through the courts, through climate litigation, arguing that the government has a duty of care to young people. And it's the Indigenous activists that I have the pleasure of working with every single day right across the Pacific who are saying to hell with drowning and fighting through the courts the global forums and the front lines of the climate crisis. I have hope in the hundreds of volunteers and hopefully many of you watching today 
who will knock on doors and share your stories of why you're fighting for a safe climate future. And I have hope that our policies to safeguard our future will reach enough people this election to seize the narrow pathway of hope that still exists for us to avoid climate catastrophe. The voters that recognise that this is the critical decade that we need to act and that it's this decade's leaders that will hold the keys to a safe climate future, if only we have them. The platform that we're taking, us Greens are taking to the election this year or next year includes the kind of reforms that give us a real shot at a safe climate future. It's banning new fossil fuel infrastructure, ending those fossil fuel subsidies of $20,000 a minute, phasing out coal, thermal coal by 2030 and putting a levy on the climate pollution that we export to other countries. To be the Greens candidate in McNamara is an incredible privilege. We are the next closest seat in the country which means when we talk to voters about McNamara, they know their next MP could be Green, that their vote is powerful and they could, that they could double the influence of the Greens in the lower house of parliament. Only a very small swing is needed to kick out the Morrison government and get the Greens in shared power, where we can push the next government further and faster on climate because God knows we need to. A new Greens MP in the lower house, the first Greens woman to be elected to the, Green, to the lower house of the federal parliament could be a game changer for this country. Just for a moment, consider instead of Barnaby Joyce calling the shots, a Green, an environmental lawyer calling the shots about what sort of future we as we people demand, what our communities demand. Now that lockdown's ended here in Victoria, I can't wait to travel back to, from my home in Alwood to the land where I was raised. Now an Indigenous led farm dedicated to healing country and bringing people together through shared and ancient history, I'll enjoy the magnificent shade of the, the river, river red gums with my partner and son. And when I do, I'll think about our campaign and how it's like a forest. Our roots run deep, we depend on each other, and together we are strong. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Steph. That was, I just loved the wording of all of that so much. And I, it's true, like our campaign and everyone who's supporting the Greens and volunteering and donating, we're like a big forest. Yeah, love that. Um, so now we're going to have some questions um, from people watching the Facebook live stream as well as the YouTube live stream coming in in just a second. And we'll um, be answering them. So first up, what's it like to be a Greens MP in an environment as toxic <laughs> as the Australian government? So Larissa, did you want to answer that? Well, look, it's not great. <laughs> it's an enormous privilege to do this role, but it certainly requires a lot of patience. The culture of parliament is pretty gross it's very sexist it's totally out of touch with science it's pretty archaic and it's very ego driven so it's it's actually a deeply unpleasant workplace <laughs> and the reason why we keep going there is because it is one of the ways that we can make change it's certainly not the only way community movements are throughout history are the way to do it but parliaments are where we can bring that community movement and implement uh, laws and decisions that can make a real difference. And I draw strength, an enormous amount of strength from my Greens colleagues. And I think without them, there's it would be a pretty hard ask. And so I really feel for Adam sitting on his own in the House of Reps, because I, I know sitting with a bunch of nine of us in the Senate, you really feel a bulwark against that awfulness. And so we need to give Adam some company. Poor boy really deserves it and needs it. And I think sitting next to Steph would be just glorious for him. And hopefully we can have Max for Griffith and Libby Watson-Brown for, for Ryan and Stephen Bates for Brisbane in there as well and a few of the other fabulous Victorian uh, lower house seats as well. So, yeah, that's a, that's a long answer to a pretty tricky question. But I guess culture is what you make it, isn't it? It's not static and we can change that toxic culture of parliament. We can make parliament about the public interest again. We can make it about the interests of nature and the community. It doesn't have to be this sort of toxic show pony stage that it is at the minute. Um, and that's up to the voters to elect people like Steph to, um, to have some decent representation and change that culture.
Oh, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Larissa. Um, I think like you spoke really well to the fact that we're like a forest banding together and we've got to, you know, stay together and build solidarity. Um, so now we have another question, which is, do we still have time? Because it seems like literally nothing happened at COP26. So what does that mean for our planet? Um, I'll pass to Bob, if you wanted to ask that. Yes, in 1987 or so, I was grabbed by the lapels by Lieutenant Colonel David Hackworth, who was the most decorated US Marine from the Vietnam War. And he said, Bob, you've got to stop talking about forests and you've got to tackle the nuclear question because Ronald Reagan's about to be elected and he's going to blow the world up. And I said to him, David, if that's the case, I'm going to get a book and go and sit by the river and have a picnic. Uh, you know, anxiety about the state of the planet is something that we all face, but uh, it's not empowering. Uh, what is empowering is optimism that we can change it for the future. I was depressed as a youngster. I spent a long time, uh, because that's reasonable. And I run into so many youngsters now who are depressed because take a look at the planet and, and how it's being mismanaged. But the antidote to that, and it's good for oneself, is to take action. And that's why I'm here with Larissa and, and uh, Ash and so many more tonight, barracking on a step. Uh, and going back to that last question, it can be toxic in Parliament, but as Larissa said, that can be changed. Decency doesn't get written up in, uh, by the press gallery, but the Greens are decent people. Uh, and a step would be another addition to that. But you heard her own presentation. She's experienced, she's strong. She would be a great addition to that team. Not a space filler like so many Labor and Liberal uh, politicians, but an active member for McNamara. And, and that, that changes things. It, it, that also, having another Green in there, is another gesture to young people that the world can change for the better. It's a tonic for them, as well as uh, for all of us older people who want to see a parliament that gets back to acting in the interests, not just of ourselves, but those who are coming after us. Yeah, thank you, Bob. I think like what you were saying about how um, like we still have time for hope and everything like makes a lot of sense and, you know, this election, we're hopefully gonna grow our presence by double or maybe even triple. Let's get it as big as we can. Um, now we have another question. So is a balance of power actually possible? And in a practical sense, what does that even mean? Um, so um, did Larissa, did you wanna talk on that? Yeah, I'd love to. Well, absolutely, it's possible. And in fact, it's the most likely outcome of the next election if the current polls are anything to go by. So thank God we're likely to see the back of this hideous current government because they are just the worst. I mean, honestly, I didn't think it could get any worse after Tony Abbott, but they keep managing to find new lows and new ways of just embarrassing all of us. Um, so, yeah, I'm very heartened by the fact that the most likely outcome is a minority parliament, a minority government with uh, a new, a new uh, major party in charge of government and the Greens in the balance of power. And what that practically means, great question to the person that, that asked that, is that the government of the day needs the agreement of the Greens to pass laws. So that's what balance of power is. It's it's who you need to talk to in order to negotiate and improve legislation to then pass it through the parliament. And at the moment, as as many people might know, uh, One Nation is in the balance of power in the Senate. So that's Pauline Hanson and her crony, both of whom are sadly from Queensland, where I hail from. And when the government wants something, they need to get One Nation to agree, which isn't hard because One Nation just love to tick off on whatever the Liberals propose. And then they need one other crossbench vote in the Senate. 
Um, so that's that's either um, Rex Patrick, Sterling Griff or Jackie Lambie. And that means that a lot of really bad laws that help the 1% and that trash the planet get passed. Now, that's, that's not a good outcome for democracy, in my opinion, uh, and we need to change that. So I'm really, really looking forward to a minority parliament with the Greens and balance of power in both houses again. And then you will finally see decent climate action that's science-based. Um, you will see genuine action on the homelessness crisis that's plaguing our country. You'll see proper funding for our public schools and our public hospitals. And we might finally see some action on gender equality, which is long overdue. So yeah, it's a really exciting prospect and that's why we're all working so hard because the planet needs us, the people need us. We've just got to get as many Greens into the parliament as possible because the community movement that we are the parliamentary wing of really needs us there. And that's why people like Steph in McNamara can make a real difference to the shape of the future because parliaments make the laws and it's about time parliament got up to speed with the science and the community and we can only do that with representatives that are there to represent the community and not just represent the big political donors or the you know the, the future um, industry bodies that they'll go to work for after they leave parliament yeah i mean um look the current government like as you said has basically the worst government we've ever had and Pauline Hansen's party being the balance of power is probably also the worst possibility to have as well. So this election <laughs> will hopefully fix a lot, a lot, a lot of problems. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> now, um, this question is specifically addressed towards Bob. So in your decades that you've been doing, you know, like environmental and activist work, um, how has like your sense of optimism and pessimism changed? Well, look, in recent times, I've become more optimistic, uh, uh, despite the appalling behaviour of our Prime Minister, our, our acting Prime Minister now, Barnaby Joyce, and I sat next to him for seven years in the Senate. Uh, you know, an unreconstructed, worst sort of um, male, uh, without a, that generosity of spirit that we would expect to have in parliamentarians and that we see, for example, in Larissa. And it's very, very strongly there in, in Steph. But I spoke at the uh, strike for climate with the young people. I didn't um, qualify there, but I spoke at their rally in Hobart just a couple of weeks ago. And that bright-eyed young, that, that, these bright-eyed young women and men who are now demanding that the world change, uh, the, the, the youngsters from Castlemaine who followed so fast after Greta Thunberg in, in getting that movement going here in Australia and, and right around this country, the brilliant speakers, I've heard them in... Um, with our Adani convoy, heard them in, in every, right up the eastern seaboard of Australia. And they bring the light uh, into, the, I, into the darkness. But they need, you need with that youth, people who are going to show you that it does matter. And in a democracy, it's parliaments and voting that changes things. And that's where I think Steph's so important because she's got that maturity, that uh, intelligence, uh, and that generosity of spirit, which will make other young people, not least young women, uh, think Parliament's a place for me to go. You know, we had Mark Latham just a few years ago telling young people they shouldn't get involved. Wrong way, Mark. Uh, maybe they shouldn't get involved with the parties as you did. But Parliament is for us. It's the people's. It's our powerhouse. And that's why it's, I feel optimistic. There's so many brilliant young people lining up give them a bit of worldly wisdom and they like Steph will become the candidates, the, the role goal candidates of the future. Yes. Oh my God. I think that, um, like you said, like the youngsters from Castlemaine, they sort of just 
I think it's been um, a major shift towards optimism in Australia with addressing climate change and the climate crisis and you know, um, also just all the other interlinked issues. Like ever since the um, kids from Castlemaine decided, oh, let's do a climate strike as well. That has totally, you know, shifted the landscape in Australia for the better. And you know, that's um, that's sort of what's informing like the big change that we are going to create this next election. Now, um, we also we have another question again from Rob. Um, who's asking? Can we accept? Uh, can we expect Labor to start trashing the Greens like they kind of already do? Um, and <laughs> how do we fight against that? Um, I'll pass to Steph if you wanted to touch. Yeah, look, I think they're going to do whatever they think is going to win them votes. And if that means trashing the Greens, they will. Um, they know that we are the strongest party, really the only party with a credible climate plan and a, a plan to protect our wilderness. Um, so, of course, they'll do it. And what do we do? We stay focused on why we're running for, why I'm running for the Greens is what I'll be focusing on. I'll be focusing on what sort of outcomes I can deliver for my community here in McNamara, but also the young people from Castle, Maine to Cairns and what, what I can do to inspire and motivate and create a safe climate future for them. So um, my, my, um, technique won't be to fight back against them and to basically sticks and stones will break my bones but names will never hurt me and just carry on with the vision with our um, science-backed policies towards delivering a safe climate future for our kids so yeah bring it labor yeah i mean i think they was kind of already doing that you know everyone's always kind of um trashed on the green so i'm used to it and we're stronger than them, more focused, more dedicated, and soon to be more powerful than them in Parliament. So, yeah. Um, so, this is from Ahmed, who's asking specifically to Larissa Do you have any stories from Parliament of how the LNP is, you know, influenced and sort of bought out by fossil fuel companies? Yeah, Ahmed, so many. Look at our entire country's absent climate policy and pathetic carbon reduction, uh, carbon emission reduction targets, which are the ones that Tony Abbott set that our Prime Minister had the chance to increase at Glasgow and chose not to. Um, I, I think sadly that's, that's evidence of the influence of fossil fuel companies. You also um, harken back through history and remember we, we were almost going to have a, a mining super profits tax and there was a $24 million campaign run by some of the big miners and hey presto, we got an, a really watered down version that, that didn't touch the sides and then they toppled the Prime Minister. The, the might and the influence of those big coal and gas and oil companies is huge. It's disproportionate to um, the jobs that they provide. It's fairly proportionate to the donations that they provide. Um, and the promises of post-parliament employment it's like a revolving door i'm sure you've heard us speak of this before um lobbyists end up being staffers or their or their parliamentarians and they just cycle through back to those industry representative bodies and um you know you, there's meant to be a cooling off period after which a minister who's supposedly regulated an area um, has to wait before they go and work for that industry sector, but frequently that cooling off period doesn't exist, and it's a cosy little, cosy little arrangement that the industry has with um, with the big parties, and it's it's really tragic because that's not how democracy is meant to work. Democracy is meant to be about representing the people, um, basing your decisions on science and the public interest, not on who just took you out for lunch and promised you a cushy job when you leave Parliament. So. I think uh, there's a few specific examples there, Ahmed, but really it's the absolute absence of science-based climate um, policies and it's the fact that every time we move an amendment to say stop funding fossil fuels or exit fossil fuels or you know look after workers in their transition, every single time both big parties vote against it. And it is both big parties. As I said, it breaks their heart every time, but unfortunately the Labor Party are just as in hoc to fossil fuels as the Liberal Party. 
which is probably why they will attack us to hearken to the last question because they know that we're not for sale and we can say the things that maybe they want to say but are constrained from from doing so it's a bit of a generous interpretation there but yes they they love to attack us but I think it was Hillary Clinton I don't know why I'm quoting her but she said when they go low we go high and I think Australians are sick of mudslinging they actually expect a bit more from their political representatives they certainly deserve a lot more so we'll keep talking about the things that matter to people and the positive policies that we've got to to fix the problems we're facing and if the mudslinging wants to happen then it, it certainly won't be coming from us we'll just point out the enormous donations that both of the big parties take and yeah who really owns them yeah i guess like it's pretty obvious how the big parties are kind of just puppets for the fossil fuel industry who is just entirely full of vested interests and you know nothing that you know actual like australian people want and you know like you like touched on in your answer australians like we're sick of it we're sick of parliament actually you know getting nothing done ever so you know it's time like we are angrier than ever before like we want something to change so you know this is really why we need to be fighting so yeah um so that was the last of our questions so thank you everyone for your amazing answers and you know like touching on all of the different issues that sort of background the current situation that we're in um did um any of you have any closing remarks that you wanted to give to all of our viewers before we wrap up I can just jump in well, and say, I, Bill, you go, Bob, you go. Just before, Steph, um, uh, I, I just think this is such a brilliant opportunity. I wish I was a voter in McNamara. It, it is, um, and, and any of us who know anybody who lives in that electorate should be calling them up. Uh, it is a dynamic opportunity uh, and a real one to, as Larissa said at the start of this session, to make a change, you know, a, a notable change by electing um, Steph into the lower house of parliament to be there with Adam, who will be in the next parliament. Uh, and you know, there'll be a polyglot of potential uh, independence there. But uh, with the Greens, you know where they're going. You know what they stand for across the board. And you know that they're going to. This is going to keep going into the future with independence, um, and some of them are very good, but they're only as good as while they're there. That it doesn't pass on into the future. So mm -hmm. I, I just say, uh, brilliant opportunity. We have donated, Steph, um, to your campaign, but watch us. We'll be donating more. I just hope everybody else understands that donating to your campaign is the difference between getting you in there and having another Labor Liberal look-alike uh, in the Parliament. So, um, everybody, go for Steph. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, thank you, Larissa, Bob, Ash, what a night. And I just draw so much inspiration from all of your work. We don't have time to tinker around the edges anymore with climate change. We don't have time to be lobbying the parties that have been bought. We don't have time for scorecards handed out on election day. We need electoral change and we need to kick out this Liberal government who are burning our future and quite frankly, not representing us. I'm incredibly proud to be a candidate here in McNamara, which extends from South Bank right through to Caulfield. And please just know that um, I, <laughs> I am, if elected, when elected, I am going to give this role everything. I am going to absolutely throw every bit of experience and energy and enthusiasm I have into representing you and into saving our planet because that's why I'm here. Um, and I want to thank you for your support. COP has been pretty disappointing so far, but please do know that over the next few weeks and months, we're going to be res responding with action and optimism and hope and a whole lot of organising right here on the ground in McNamara. If you're watching tonight and you can afford to donate, please do. Uh, you know, Labor Party, my opponent here is going to be going straight to the fossil fuel donors saying, this is what the Greens are going to do if they're in balance of power. This is how much money I need. Get your checkbook out. We don't have that luxury and nor do we want it. But our, what we have got is, is you and the power of the movement that the Greens have built 
since Bob was elected all those years ago. Thank you for your support, um, whether it's donating or door knocking or joining us on the hustings over the next few months. We really, I reckon we've got this. We can win McNamara and we can seize balance of power and um, change the direction of this nation. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's a wrap. Oh, there's Ash's back. Great. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, I disappeared from the screen. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Um, I think it's really like tonight we've put it really into perspective. And let's be real, Steph, you're going to win this. Who? Where's the other candidate that actually cares about you know everything and also just like McNamara, like for real? <laughs> think about it, actually. Um, yeah, um, as you know, all of us have mentioned, uh, if you have the capacity so nice. to donate cool. to Steph's campaign, please do. Um, it, you know, it means a lot every dollar. But yeah, um, thanks so much, everybody, for coming tonight. And yeah, we look forward to seeing you at future events and coming to more panels. And we look forward to seeing more of the Greens actually in Parliament. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Steph. I can't wait to see Thanks, you folks. with Thanks you. Thanks for all the questions <laughs> online and on YouTube. You, really appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.